I'm interested in the movement of people, um, and in particular, I'm interested in the way we can use maps and visualization, data graphics, to understand how and why we move around towns, around cities, around the world. And I want to illustrate um, the approach we can take by mapping movement in order to understand it by looking at movement through the city of London. Um, and in order to do that, I have to step off this magic red carpet just to give you a few landmarks here. So we've got a map of London on the screen. Um, above me here, Hyde Park, big green blob. Above that, right to the north, Regent's Park. The Thames, obvious landmark. Um, right in the top right-hand corner there, you can see the Olympic Park and Victoria Park. Um, and we are right in the top right-hand corner of that map. And I want to start with a journey. Um, the journey that I made from my place of work on a bicycle to this location here. You can see it on the screen. Um, I started in the sort of Clerkenwell area. I cycled east. Um, I went through uh, Shoreditch to the uh, southern corner of Victoria Park. Um, went south to Marl End, then went northeast up to Bow uh, until I arrived here on bicycle. Now, that's one journey. Now, if I had just shown you that journey as a line on a map, you would probably, most of us would struggle to know why that journey had been made, particularly if you didn't have the benefit of the context of this event today. And what I'm interested in is if we look at many, many journeys and visualize them in the right way, perhaps we can understand why people make these journeys across our cities. So I'm going to show you many, many journeys um, in, a, in a little while. But in order to do that, I need to make space. I need to make space on the map, so I'm going to remove the buildings. So you have to remember those landmarks I pointed out. The Thames is still there. The parks are still there. Um, because I'm going to remove the parks as well. And I'm going to darken things a little bit. Um, but remember that, that map of London that we've got here, because that's going to be the basis for um, what we start superimposing upon it. Um, there's my journey again on a bicycle um, to get here this afternoon. Um, but I'm going to make one more simplification. I'm going to ignore all the tiny little left-right turns I made to get from work to here and replace it with a single smooth line. Now, the design of that line is important because it shows the direction of travel. Um, you'll notice the line has um, a straight end and a curvy end. And it's, uh, the straight end will always reflect the origin of my journey or the journeys you're going to see. The curvy end represents the destination. And by simplifying the line, it allows us to see many, many journeys at once um, rather than just the one I took this afternoon. And those many journeys are going to be represented by the way we cycle around London. And in particular, the way that we cycle around London using London's public cycle hire scheme um, on these blue bikes, as was mentioned. Now, I, I have a great enthusiasm for this scheme for a couple of reasons. One is because I think if we think about mobility within a city context, bicycles are a really important part of um, that mobility. Um, they are a sustainable way of moving around the city. They are democratic in the sense that with public schemes like this, uh, you don't need expensive equipment. You don't need helmets, lycra, um, high vis You don't need a large house to store your bikes. You can turn up with a pound uh, for 24 hours access to one of these bikes and move around the city. They're important. They're also exciting to me because um, every time you take one of these bikes from one of the docking stations, um, that's logged in a database. And every time you return it to another place, it's logged. And so we get a sense of where people are moving around London um, in a way that we've never had before. Because when millions of people, and we have had millions of journeys made, we've had about 16 million journeys made with this scheme in the last two years, um, we now know the nature of those journeys in a way that we've never been able to understand before. So let me show you what happens when you look at um, 16 million journeys um, across London. Um, so each one of those blue dots is representing someone cycling on one of those blue bikes. Um, I've, I've compressed two years of activity um, so that they're all happening simultaneously here, but we still get a sense of where, possibly, where people are choosing to cycle. Now, I don't know about you, but um, an image like that, it's hypnotic. I could stare at that for hours and hours. In fact, I do. That's part of my job. Um, <laughs> but it probably tells us little more than there is lots of cycling going on in the city. It's a dynamic city. It's sort of organic. It has lots of organic metaphors spring to mind. You know, ants in ant colonies, brain activity, uh, you can probably, you know, birth of star systems. It, it, it's somehow compelling. But I would argue probably not 
that useful in really understanding what's going on. So we can do something slightly more sophisticated. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just slightly lengthen the trails of each of those bicycle movements so that you can see not only where bikes are going, but where they've been. They leave a trail behind them. And then I'm going to do something else. I'm going to start removing the journeys that happen least frequently so that we're left with just the most common journeys that people take around London. And something amazing happens. We start to see a structure emerge in the way that we choose to cycle around the city. You start to see these hubs appear where there's more cycling and these gaps where there is less cycling. Now, if you remember your map of London, you'll see on, over here, Hyde Park. There's a clear um, pattern of cycling around Hyde Park. Um, in the center towards the top, we've got lots of cyclists coming down from King's Cross. Towards the bottom, another hub of movement away from um, Waterloo Station. So this structure has emerged simply by changing the way visually we choose um, to represent those journeys. Okay, now there are two ways you can use the scheme. Um, if, you're, if you sign up as a member, you get one of these keys. And these keys allow you to turn up at one of the docking stations, insert the key, take the bike uh, instantly, and go on your journey. Alternatively, you can turn up with a credit card, and you're charged a pound for 24 hours access um, in order to use the scheme. Now, what's interesting about this is that it, um, we can distinguish between those people who've registered in advance to um, cycle around London and those who do so um, on spec um, just by turning up with a credit card. And we see some interesting patterns. Um, if we look at the days of the week, for example, that people choose to ride their bicycles, um, we find that those who've registered with the scheme are more likely to be cycling during the week, Mondays to Fridays. And we can guess why that might be. So the blue bars there represent the numbers of people. Typically, about, um, we're getting about 25,000 journeys a day on average over the last two years, um, of which the majority are from members during the week. But during the weekends, the majority of people who turn up with credit cards. So we're already seeing a difference in pattern in terms of when people choose to cycle, depending on how they've decided to use the scheme. If we look at the whole history of the scheme, so from the left to the right, we've got um, 2010, August, when the scheme started up to last month on the right-hand side, we see that those who registered to use the scheme, the blue bars, reasonably static over time. The same number of journeys being made throughout the last two years, typically on a daily basis, um, by those members. But if you look at the green bars on top, they're increasing over time. Increasingly, more and more people are using the scheme with a credit card, and they're also um, using the scheme in a way that is much more seasonal. Um, in the summer months, we've got more use than the winter months. If we do the same but break down by week um, over the last two years, we can start relating this to um, events. So obvious dips there at Christmas time, for example, where there are fewer journeys made by both members and non-members. Um, if you, there's an effect of the Olympics um, just around the corner from us on the right-hand side, we can see there's uh, some peak, uh, slight difference in uh, behavior there. And in fact, things like industrial action on the tube network results in small peaks as well. So we can start relating this to events. But this is really only exploring when people choose to cycle. I'm particularly interested in where. So again, we, we'll start with the, um, this representation of all these, these movements of bikes. But I've colored them according to whether we're dealing with members or casual users. At the moment, these are all journeys, but I'm going to start to filter out the less common ones. And again, something remarkable happens. We start getting a structure, but a quite clear distinction between the people who are paying credit card, with credit cards in green, using Hyde Park particularly, that's dominated by that. Um, but if you go north of Hyde Park, you can see Regent's Park, people cycling around the park there in green. And uh, closer to us in Stratford, uh, we've got Mile End, that sort of green um, flower-like thing on the right-hand side there. We've got the Isle of Dogs. We've got people moving down to the river. Um, and we know um, from looking at when and where these patterns happen that these are essentially leisure-based journeys, um, people going out for the day at the weekend, as opposed to the blue areas from the members who are using this largely for commuting. So what I hope that demonstrates is that um, by representing the same data in uh, using color and filtering out some of the things we're less interested in, we reveal structure um, in these 16 million journeys that we've been, uh, people have been making in the last two years that we'd otherwise have not been able to spot. So, I, I want to, the, the final example I want to describe to you is um, the role that gender
plays in cycling behavior because gender is a, a quite important indicator of the maturity, in my view, of um, a cycling city. If you look around Europe at the cities where cycling journeys are made most frequently, um, in Copenhagen, Denmark, in, in the Netherlands, typically about 25 to 30% of all journeys made in an urban context there are on a bicycle. In those same cities, more than half the people who cycle are women. Okay, it's about a 50-50 balance, but with a slight majority of women cycling. In London, um, it's closer to um, about 20% of um, uh, cyclists are women, about 80% are men on this scheme. Um, and what you're seeing on the screen here is, um, what I've done is I've taken each of those um, pairs of docking stations where you take a bike from and you, and you eventually dock it somewhere else, and I've ranked them from the most popular journeys on the left to the least popular journeys on the right. And if you do that and then count the number of people who make those journeys, you get this very typical pattern, um, uh, this, this uh, power law pattern, uh, as it's known, or exponential pattern, which says that there are very few routes that are very popular and very many routes that are not so popular. And we see both men and women follow this same pattern. But what's interesting is that the, the stations that are popular with men and the stations that are popular with women are not the same ones. So if we take that same idea of ranking our um, station, our journeys from the most popular to the least, from left to right, as, as I've done here, and we look at the difference between male and female um, riders taking those journeys, and that gray line there is the 80-20 split which reflects the general imbalance um, of, of cycling between men and women. We see that the very most popular journey, which is um, near Liverpool Street, um, on the left-hand side there, is almost entirely dominated by male riders. Uh, about 96-7% of the of people who do that are men. In other words, the journeys that are most popular with men are not the same as the journeys that are most popular with women. And this tells us something about the motivations for people to make their journeys by bicycle, and it tells us something about how we might encourage people to make journeys that they might not otherwise um, wish to do. If we look at this at the top 50 um, routes, if we look at the second set of 50, in other words, from 51 to 100, uh, we start to see that um, women take up a larger proportion of um, the journeys in this um, order sequence. And in particular, we notice that the that the red bars that peak above the 20% the line there um, tend to be associated with the parks. And we saw the very strong influence of the parks when we looked at the difference between members and non-members. Um, so let me sh show you the final visualization here. So what I'm doing is I'm showing men and women in, in blue and red again. But firstly, just the most popular routes. So I've reversed the order in which I've done this now. I'm just showing the most popular routes. And gradually, I'm going to reintroduce the routes that are less popular. Fewer people make those particular journeys. And what you see is that the red pattern, in other words, more and more women start emerging um, on the screen here in terms of the journeys that they're making. So there's a very different um, distribution of um, cycling around the city depending on gender. If you like, um, the journeys that women make, and I've zoomed into Hyde Park here uh, with a bit of the Thames on the right there, um, the journeys that women make tend to be more evenly distributed around the city whereas um, the journeys that men tend to make are concentrated in particular areas associated with commuting behavior attached to mainline railway stations. Now, this kind of insight uh, is useful for, for planners. It's useful for Transport for London, for example, um, who wish to understand why people make these journeys. And I hope it also illustrates that by showing these patterns with pictures, we really do get some insight that we might not otherwise have got. So what I want to sort of leave you with, really, is, is my enthusiasm, I hope, for both thinking about cycling as an important way of moving around a city without borders, um, that public cycle schemes are a very democratic way of encouraging that, that the new data sources that these schemes generate allow us to understand behavior in a way that we've never been able to understand with such detail before. And I think that we really are in exciting times in terms of understanding um, movement behavior in this kind of context for, um, because of the, the, the data that are generated in this way. Thank you very much. <laughs>